Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me and um, thank you to Jenna and everyone at Campaign Against Arm Trade um, for putting this together and to the speakers you've already spoken. It's, it, it's, it's already starting to give me a lot to think on. Um, first of all, um, what I'm going to be speaking to everyone a little bit about is really the relationship and the kind of blurring of lines between militarization and policing um, as has occurred over the last 50 or 60 years, um, particularly in reference um, to the war on drugs. Um, I think we often think about conflicts in global terms, in terms of like conflicts between nation states and that kind of old model of warfare, but um, I think the looking at the war on drugs uh, tells us a lot about how um, the idea of war and the idea of policing has really mutated over the last few decades um, to kind of um, start to cross boundaries between each other and lead to this to the situation in which, um, yeah, kind of um, the arms that we would usually associate as being for warfare, we now see on um, everyday streets, not only in places like the United States of America, but other places like Brazil and Colombia, um, and you know, on some occasions in terms of armed policemen right here in the United Kingdom as well. Um, you know, I think that the, the presentation we just had from Sham had a really great um, uh, a moment which kind of pointed towards what I want to speak about when, um, you know, we were discussing how, um, you know, what do we call the situation in, 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 in Yemen? Do we call it a humanitarian crisis? Do we call it a war? Do we call it, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a catastrophe? Um, I think that that speaks to a lot of how uh, uh, we used to have all these kind of strict um, boundaries between the idea of policing and warfare. You know, warfare used to be um, between two nation states with kind of symmetrical armies and there was a kind of objective goal, you know, they capture the capital city and then that's the end of warfare. And then policing is, you know, what I think a lot of people still imagine policing to be um, when, you know, the kind of local Bobby on the beat who's just trying to, you know, care for the community. Um, but instead, what we now see is, um, kind of conflicts taking that kind of indefinite um, 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 structure, um, you know, where conflicts kind of go on without any end. You know, we can see that with the war on terror where they don't seem to be directly between countries anymore, even though we can see that in the war on terror. Um, the idea from the, the West is that it's, that it's, it's not just Britain and America against uh, Iraq, but it's kind of humanity against these rogue elements that you know we have to all unify to try and to try and um, combat, and that there isn't this kind of set objective. These wars seem to go on forever and forever, which is obviously great news to the arms trade because that means there's more and more arms to sell. Um, and I think that when we want to talk about that change, we have to look at the war on drugs and we have to look at what the war on drugs did to policing in particularly the West, but also globally. Um, I think it's a really exciting time to be talking about this, um, you know, with all the conversations around defunding the police, abolishing the police, um, you know, the, the scenes that we saw with the George Floyd murder and so many others before that has really galvanized people to question, well, what is the police force? Um, and what kind of role does it play within our current societies? Um, I think that when people get kind of defensive about this idea of abolishing the police, they often imagine that the, you know, policing is still that kind of localized Bobby on the beat. And I think that having a look at the history of the drug war can really help us identify how that has changed over the past few decades. Um, so that's what I'm going to share with everyone a little bit today. Um, I think we need to start off with, you know, where did this idea of the war on drugs come from? Where did this idea of calling what's essentially supposedly a policing strategy, trying to, you know, prohibit and police the trade of drugs in our streets, gain the language of war? And, you know, is it simply a metaphor? Is it something that's actually in practice? Um, the first time the idea of the war on drugs was used was by US President Richard Nixon, um, who used it in a speech in 1971. And um, the thing that's really interesting about Nixon is that, you know, he really presented himself as this kind of law and order president and, you know, talked about kind of repairing the American consciousness. But um, it was explicitly based upon this idea of a fear of a counterculture that was rising at the time, particularly a counterculture that was, that was in opposition to the American war in Vietnam. Um, 
in 2016, there was actually an interview with um, Richard Nixon, one of his chief aides, a gentleman called John Iruckman. And um, the quote that he gave about Nixon adopting his policy of the war on drugs is really interesting. So I'm just going to read that in full for everyone. So this is what Ackman said. He goes, um, you want to know what it was really all about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to either be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about drugs? Of course we did. And so that's a recent interview from one of Nixon's chief aides about why they adopted this war on drug policy. And I think that's really, really insightful. Um, you know, um, obviously nothing's been said about Nixon himself, and it is important to recognize that a lot of the more draconian um, drug policy strategies came after the Nixon presidency. Um, you know, they did in include some stuff around kind of public health domestically, but internationally, they already started to adopt that language of this needs to be a global war to try and address this particular policing issue. And so this language really gets adopted um, not only by future American presidents, but by in international institutions like the United Nations in 1998, the United Nations has a, a special session on the world drug policy, which um, is held under the slogan, a drug-free world, we can do it. You know, people can decide how successful that's been for themselves, or they could look at the UN's own statistics as well, which um, talks about, you know, after, despite over a hundred billion pounds per annum currently being spent on enforcing the war on drugs globally, um, in 2017, the United Nations own Office on Drugs and Crime estimated that, you know, over 271 million people or around, um, you know, five to 10 percent of the global population between 15 and 64 had used prohibited drugs in the previous year. And so despite all of this uh, money that's being put into counter narcotics programs, into weaponry, into um, in enlarging prison systems, what we've seen statistically is increases in uses of drugs, the trade of drugs, the addiction to drugs, um, all going up year after year. And so we then have to start to think of our, think to ourselves, you know, what is the purpose of this particular warfare if it's not doing what it's said, which is reducing use of drugs and creating this kind of drug-free world. So um, following Nixon, the war on drugs as a, as a phrase begins, it's adopted by almost all the following presidents, Ronald Reagan. Um, he declares, um, there's nothing in my life that's frightened me as much as the drug war. Um, we've taken down the surrender flag and we've run up the battle flag. We're going to win the war on drugs. Um, so you're already starting to use that language of militarization. In 1989, his successor, George Bush the first um, has this famous speech where he talks about how um, drug enforcement agents have picked up a bag of cocaine just over the street from the White House. Um, you know, this uh, idea that they've kind of, you know, invaded the very territory of the US presidency. And so he says, we're going to win the war on drugs. It's going to be hard won, neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, child by child. Um, and then this is language is again is adopted by Bill Clinton talks about the war on drugs. It fell off a little bit with George Bush the second and with Barack Obama who tried to avoid the kind of controversy around the phrase. But with Donald Trump, um, we've seen the rest this language return to the to the to the to the to the to the kind of yeah to the debating sphere again. Um, so in 2017, he says how the US is ready to wage war in capital letters on the drugs cartels and wipe them off the face of the earth. And so what has been the consequences of the war on drugs then? So we know that it's increased um, the capacity for lethal force for police forces all around the world. We know that it's increased um, the um, rates of incarceration all around the world, asset seizure, land disposition. Um, when we think about places like Mexico and Colombia, um, when, we, when we think about the United Kingdom, um, Suspicion of drugs is the number one reason why stop and searches are conducted in our streets. 
um, out of the 82,000 currently imprisoned people in the United Kingdom, over 11,000 of them, so one out of every eight, is in prison for drug charges, um, never mind the, the amount of those who might be already in prison with drugs as a multiplier of their sentence. And so it's really been something that's been crucial in constructing um, the prison industrial complex and as the work of people like Michelle Alexander, um, who noted that the United States imprisons a larger percentage of its black people now as a result of the drug war than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. You know, Angela Davis has written about this. Um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore has particularly written about the relationship between the drug laws and the three strikes rule implemented in California and the impact that's had on Black and Latino populations. And, um, you know, I think that when we want to talk about how can we create a world free of police, free of prisons, we have to confront the history of the, um, the drug war. And that's just talking about it in countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. When we look at it internationally, then we really see where that militarization has really kind of um, gained, gained, gained power and gained strength. Um, one particular example I'll throw out quickly is the um, example in Colombia. You know, I'm sure anyone who's seen Narcos um, has a fair understanding of how this story played out, but. Um, uh, a, a great example of the militarization of the of the drug war is a project that was known as Plan Colombia that was implemented in 1999 um, between the United States and Colombia in order to try and confront the drug war. It was supposed to be an aid plan in how it was presented, but research has shown up to 80% of the financing that was provided by the United States was ring-fenced for military assistance. And so it was all used towards expanding the capacity of police forces, expanding the capacity of aerial fumigation policies. So planes flying over rural areas within Colombia, within the Cali district, spraying pesticides indiscriminately, um, where, you know, often indigenous and Afro-Colombian kind of um, rural communities would lose their entire means of subsistence because you're not just destroying anyone who might be growing some coca, you're destroying people who might just be growing crops to, to eat or to trade. Um, huge devastating consequences for Colombia um, reinforcing as well the ongoing civil conflict that was occurring within that country and what was the, the what was the consequences of Plan Colombia? Was it successful in its stated goal which was to reduce the illegal trade of narcotics from Colombia by 50% in six years? No it wasn't. Um, the reports by the United States Government Accountability Office showed that um, between 2006 and 2000-2006 the um, rate of um, uh, cocaine cultivation in Colombia had increased by 15% and the rate of cocaine production in Colombia had increased by 4%. So rather than decrease by 50% as it was promised, it actually had ended up going up despite them spending $4.9 billion um, supporting the Colombian military and police force to combat narco trafficking and another $1.3 billion to like increase um, the capacity for kind of um, punitive legal policy. So the training of judges and kind of wider justice sector reforms. Um, also, the human cost of it was substantial. Um, between 1998 and 2008, the drug fueled conflict in the, in the state of Colombia it was estimated at killing over 30,000 people and displacing an additional 3.4 million people. Um, all the time, cocaine production is, of course, going up. And so, you know, I think we really need to sit down and um, reckon with how the war on drugs has paved the way for so many of those kind of um, blurring of policing and military um, uh, phenomena that we face today. When we think about the relationship between the war on drugs and the war on terror, often there's a legislative relationship. The laws in terms of wiretapping, in terms of searching and surveillance that were introduced to combat the war on drugs under the Reagan and Clinton administration were then used and were, were expanded by the Bush administration in terms of the war on drugs, but also ideologically in terms of making us think that you know, wars are these things that never end, the wars are these things that have no particular kind of criteria, the wars are these things that are um, kind of internal, that they, they, they don't have particular boundaries, there's no distinction between 
enemy combatants and civilians. You know, there's no distinction between narco traffickers and, and civilians, that violence needs to be visited upon these dangerous areas indiscriminately, and that these wars are being done in the name of humanity. They're not being done for a specific military objective or for a specific national objective. They're being done for the betterment of humanity as a whole. And so I think that it's a really interesting time to try and challenge the war on drugs because we're seeing a lot of um, pushback against that with a lot of really interesting drug policy reform movements all around the world. Um, some of them, Drug Policy Alliance, run by Cassandra Frederick in the United States, I'd say probably the paradigmatic example of this, really censoring um, questions of racial justice and geographic justice as well, um, really trying to reckon with those histories of empire and racism that have underpinned the war on drugs. Um, but I think if we're going to be talking about trying to push back against the trade of arms around the world, we do need to talk about pushing back against those war on drugs. Thank you very much. <laughs>